Hello everybody and welcome to another Arkham Horror of the Card Game Archetype Guide. Today we are on Seeker and the archetype we are talking about Seeker is Relics. So like some of our previous uh, archetype guides, this is kind of spread out over the entire game. However, uh, the Forgotten Age cycle is where this archetype gets the majority of its meat from. So if you are interested in this archetype, look at picking up the, uh, the Forgotten Age stuff um, because you'll get a lot of nice payoffs for that as well as an investigator who is incredibly relevant to that. So why don't we dive in and before we start looking at the notable cards, Bryn, what's the goal of this archetype? Uh oh <laughs> oh no did i mute myself somehow well, oh okay we're good no i i can fill in um okay go for it it's Travis. uh i'm not sure happens with Bryn. yeah this is like the only yellow archetype that Bryn has ever played and might ever play so that's why we're <laughs> giving the reins to him but um it's to play relics a lot of really powerful cards are relics mm -hmm. and uh just kind of increase the odds of finding them and using them to the most of their ability heck yeah Pretty simple. Yeah. Why don't we get to some of these notable cards so you can kind of see what we're talking about. Uh, so first off, this is, uh, I think Bryn has referred to her as the BFF, or at least the hopeful BFF of one Ursula Downs. This is Dr. Ellie yeah, Horowitz. Yeah, you get the friendship bracelet. Yeah, especially when you get the friendship bracelet, yeah. Uh, so after she enters play, you get to search the top nine cards of your deck for a relic asset and attach it to her. Shuffle your deck. And then each relic asset attached to Dr. Ellie Horowitz does not take up any slots, and it is still considered, considered to be in play and under your control. So with Dr. Ellie, she can hold something that would take up a hand slot if your hands were full, or uh, other slots that you might need to uh, use other things for. Um, and it's just helpful, because not only does it find your relic, and uh, it gets that relic into play. And... You don't need to pay the cost on that relic either, which is pretty sweet, especially if you get a nice big expensive one. Um, yeah, like a lot of the strongest relics do cost three or more, um, mm -hmm. which means that you're at least breaking even. Yeah. Uh, with Dr. Ellie. Yeah. And, you know, if you're grabbing something that costs more than that, obviously you're making money. So mm -hmm. that's pretty good. Uh, and then one thing that it might be, a, this, this is going to sound really simple for people who know this game quite a bit, but a relic, because uh, every card has traits, a relic is a trait on a card. So as you see, Dr. Ellie is an ally and assistant. Once we get to starting to the relics, anything with the relic trait, as you can see with the relic asset in uh, Dr. Ellie's text box, is uh, bolded and italicized. That is meaning the trait for relic once we get to those assets. Uh, Bryn, are you back yet? Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm here. All right, no, it's all good. Why yeah. not, I'll let you talk about Unearth the Ancients. I'll, I'll, I'll throw that one to you. <laughs> all right. Uh, it's also worth noting for Dr. Ellie Horowitz that uh, if you find a relic that discards itself for use, so much the better. Then you get a you get a free one-two soak to go along with it. And she's not really your best friend anymore. Yeah, nope. that's, that's nope, where... she is not. That's why we always joke uh, that Dr. Ellie hopes that you get the friend friendship bracelet which we will get to yeah. once we talk about yeah. the friendship bracelet uh, so on earth the ancients uh it costs one we get to investigate we choose a yellow asset in our hand the difficulty of the skill test is equal to the chosen assets printed cost if you succeed instead of discovering clues put the chosen asset into play if that asset has the relic trait draw one card mm -hmm. now this card is kind of not great, unless you're playing on Don't some of the easier difficulties. In the, deck. in the deck, you can't say it's bad. It, that's, it's too late. <laughs> it's too late, Father. I've seen everything. <laughs> uh, large, largely because it's basically an emergency cache that requires you to make a test. Mm -hmm. However, that being said, uh, depending on which relics you want to put into play, this could be a very solid economy choice in order to make that happen. I think you can also do something neat with this in Rex, where you can investigate with a cheap relic on a high shroud location and succeed by two or more and discover a clue at your location. Oh, and then draw a card as well. So, yeah, like that's that's kind of neat. That seems sweet, There's actually. A, yeah. Uh, but I yeah, this, this card's also pretty to, okay. To sate... Um, 
Ursula is called the unknown? Yeah, yeah, definitely, because it, it would be investigate the location. If you're at that chosen location, it would definitely work that way. Yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe. Uh, then we got uh, we got Witten Green. She is pretty sweet. Mm -hmm. She's like not quite so like fitted or tailored to this archetype as Ellie is. Pretty good. Well, we control a tome or a relic asset, we get plus one book. She's a four cost ally with two health and two sanity. As a reaction effect, after we reveal a location or put a new location into play, we can exhaust her to search the top six cards of our deck for a tome or relic asset mm -hmm. and draw it and shuffle. Uh, and the upgraded one gives us plus one brain as well, while we control a, a relic asset, has an extra point of sanity, and we get to search the top nine cards instead of six. So we're just much more likely to find what we're looking for. And in this archetype, you want to have your very your, your relics in play. So you can just look at her as a boost to your brain in yeah. your book when you have the experienced version. And that's that's pretty sweet. Yeah, there, there are uh, many of the very strong relics are exceptional. So the hard part about them is finding them and getting them into play. And these guys will help you do a good job of that. And not to spoil who's coming up for our investigator deck at the end, but uh, when... Uh, Win and Green also has some nice, like obviously, you're gonna with this with her in play, you're gonna want to be the one who discovers like reveals locations. However, uh, with someone like uh, Ursula Downs, Win and Green is also exceptionally uh, good with that as well because you're naturally gonna be moving, getting a free investigate. So it's like it's even more uh, goodness even you more get out free of free stuff. Yeah. Yeah. If I, for everyone watching at home, if I'm saying garbage words today, it's because I'm not feeling great and my brain can't think of... It's value. Value is the word I was looking for there. You just get more value out of Wood and Green with Ursula Downs. Sick. Let's go to the next uh, page of cards. All right. So we have the unexperienced, the level zero, and the level two Disc of Exomna. Uh These are relics that you kind of just set and forget until they need to do things. Uh, one thing to note, as you can see on this page as well, relics take up, these four relics in particular take up your necklace slot, and a lot of relics will do that. So that's why someone like Dr. Ellie is really good, because she allows you to have two necklace slots, and then when you get something like Relic Hunter, if you do go very heavy on the uh, accessory slot, uh, it'll be something you want to look as, as well. Relic Hunter is from the, Dun the Dunwich Legacy uh, cycle, uh, but it also is a very easy card to proxy if you just want to play with Relic Hunter and not have to if you can't get the cycle because it's out of stock currently. Uh, the unex the uh, level zero Disc of Exomna, when a non-elite enemy spawns your location, you discard it and then you automatically evade or deal two damage to that enemy. And the uh, level two one is you can just discard that enemy. So it's just like, see you later. Uh, Bryn, the Tooth of Etsley, <laughs> this is our friendship uh, bracelet. Why do we call this it is, that? Yeah, this is, this is the friendship bracelet. Mm -hmm. uh, so this one just takes up your accessory slot. It costs three. You get plus one brain and plus one foot while resolving an ability on a treachery card. As a reaction effect, after we succeeded a skill test on a treachery card, we can exhaust it to draw a card. Uh, this one's pretty sweet. Uh, it just protects you from the game. Yeah. Because and, if, uh, if you haven't watched our new player guides... Uh, the Mythos deck is going to target you most, first and foremost, through Brain, and then second most through Foot. Uh, most commonly, anyway. There are some scenarios where that is the exception, but Brain and Foot are like your defensive stats. Uh, and this giving you those uh, for those tests while also uh, drawing cards after you succeed at skill tests is nice value there. Uh, we then got the Elder Sign Amulet. Which just gives you four more brain power if you need it. If you need to not take horror and die, the Elder Sign Amulet is super sweet for that. It certainly is. Sick. Travis, I'll pass these ones to you, because they're all kind of the same thing. Yes, yeah, so this is uh, an ancient stone. Um, you have to have pain experience to get the base version, the untranslated version, into your deck. And then as an action, you can investigate. Your location gets plus three shroud for this investigation. And if you succeed, you get one additional clue. Discard the ancient stone and record in your campaign log that you have identified the stone. And then you mark a tally, uh, which is the difficulty of the skill test. 
So if you're in Shroud 3 location and you use this and you succeed because the test will be 6, you will mark 6 next to it. And then once you upgrade it again to one of these uh, level 4 versions, it'll come. In, they each come to play with uh, a number of secrets equal to the difficulty of the test, the tally that you marked earlier. And they do a different thing when you draw cards. One of them deals damage to an enemy location. One of them uh, heals horror from a card, not an investigator, any card at your location. And one of them uh, allows you to move that many times. They're all like pretty solid. Um, obviously the damage one is like the good, good one. Mm -hmm. But the other two are definitely like quite strong yeah. as well. Ancient Stone, uh, the the Horror Healy one, Minds in Harmony, is definitely a little bit more of a support card. Um, but especially if you're playing with certain characters like uh, like Agnes or other or potentially Calvin, I guess, um, characters who want to inflict horror on themselves or who just have lower low horror scores, it can be a very solid choice for them. And then the movement one is, I mean, like just. It's pretty sweet to be able to play, um, like, a cryptic research to draw three cards, but also move three times yeah, for no action. Sick. Yeah. It's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Sick. All right. Uh, Bryn, I'll throw these ones to you. All right. We got the key of ease. So you can't see, but this one has four sanity on it. Uh, it costs three. We get plus one to each of our skills for each horror on the key of ease. Forced when any amount of horror would be placed on you, place one of that horror on key of ease. Uh, when it leaves play, you discard the top 10 cards of your deck, which is really not as big a deal as it sounds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, the, the key thing about the, the key thing uh, <laughs> uh, about this card is that it only, it, the forced ability that requires you to place horror on it only applies if the horror is being placed on your investigator card. Mm -hmm. So if you have, like, I don't know, maybe some other relics, like uh, maybe an Elder Sign amulet, they can just eat the horror that you would take, allowing you to keep your key of use fully charged at three, giving you plus three, plus three to all your stats. And, like, which, uh, at that point, it's, like, impossible yeah. to die. <laughs> yeah, like, even if you're playing Calvin, you're like, I have threes if I have no damage on me. <laughs> like, how you can't... Uh, there's no way that can be bad. No. Uh, yeah, we got to, we got the ornate bow, which is an interesting option for low fist investigators to fight. Costs four, uses one ammo, limit one ammo on ornate bow. As an action, you spend one ammo to fight. This attack uses foot instead of punch. You get plus two foot and deal plus two damage for the attack. And as an action, you can knock another arrow. Place one ammo on the ornate bow. So it is a little slow and awkward, but you know maybe if your foot is four and your punch is one, and you need to kill something, it's a pretty good choice. Heck yeah. Uh, got an otherworld compass, which might actually be the worst relic in the game. <laughs> uh, this card is basically flashlight, but worse sometimes. Mm -hmm. Many times. Sometimes uh, it's better, though. Yeah. yeah some, sometimes it's better, but it also shouldn't matter when it is. Uh, yeah. Anyway, my complaints aside. Uh, cost two, as an action, you exhaust it, and you investigate your location gets minus X shroud for this this investigation. X is the number of revealed locations connected to your location. For me, the thing that kills this is that they have to be revealed. Mm. So, like, you can't just walk... Like, you have to you have to open up like the entire map for this to start doing things. But if you're trying to, I don't know, maybe use a flashlight that doesn't have a limited number of uses, this could be the card for you. Yeah, because you'll usually pretty commonly yeah. be able to get two out of this. Yeah, it works a lot better if you're the higher the player count because the more, more locations will just be revealed by more people playing the game. Definitely. Uh, then not. Now that we've got its its best friend here, the hemispheric map. Uh, I used to hate this one. I hate it only slightly less now. <laughs> uh, 
Well, your current location is connected to at least two other locations. You get plus one brain and plus one book. While your current location is connected to at least four other locations, you get an additional plus one brain and plus one book. This the card, bottom part of this is basically flavor text. Yeah, this card reads so yeah. exciting, and then it just, like, the bottom one never triggers, but I, it, no, it sorry, never is the wrong word. It's It triggers, and it's happened with Bryn, where we were like, Bryn, <laughs> you've done it! <laughs> you know? Uh, but that being said, the disappointment of not being able to hit the ceiling on this card pretty much ever is pretty balanced out by the fact that getting to pay two and often a not very important slot for plus one to two of your stats mm -hmm. is like kind of good yeah that's nice yeah sick i think there's one more slide oh i think there's actually two more slides holy crap there's a lot of, well there's a lot of juicy relics um so there we have time-worn brand this is a five cost five experience weapon that gives the chop uh as an action you can uh, if it's ready you can fight you get plus two fist and deal plus one damage for this attack. Uh, as another action, you can exhaust Tidemorn Brand and fight, adding your brain to your, to your skill value for this attack. This attack deals plus three damage. If this attack defeats a non-elite, an elite enemy, sorry, an elite enemy, draw three cards, max once per game. So like, this is like here to kill the boss or the elite enemy that has victory that you just need to like get rid of. And it does it so sick. Like that's four damage and three cards, because mm -hmm. you're going to be aiming to defeat the guy with that attack. That's, like, juicy. And even just it's plus two attack, plus one damage once a turn is still really nice, because uh, Time Lord Brand, it's a, it takes up one hand slot, so you can, like, hold something else relevant in your other hand, like, say, like, maybe a gun or a survival knife, and, like, you can just beat the crap out of things no problem. Time War, you can use the top action on Time War Brand as many times as you'd like in a turn. It doesn't. The top one oh, doesn't, doesn't exhaust. exhaust it. it just has to be ready in order for it to My work. My mistake. So, it's you know, even better. Pete, it's terrible in Pete. Take that gun. Sometimes you're racked with nightmares. <laughs> uh, take that gun in your other hand, throw it away. You only need the beady stick now. That's all you need. Oh, you only need the beady stick. Yeah. Uh, then we got the Narcotic Manuscripts, which is a super fun, super exciting uh, relic that usually ends up being the big juicy part of the relic decks I have played. So it has three secrets. It costs five and takes up a hand slot and also five experience. There's a trend here. Uh, with the three secrets, when an investigator at your location would perform a skill test as a reaction, uh, sorry, during a rev revelation effect, spend one secret, do not reveal chaos tokens for this test. So they can just succeed. Uh, if they have enough skill, power, or skills committed to just have the test happen. As an action, you can also spend one secret. Choose an investigator at your location. Do not reveal chaos tokens for the next skill test that the investigator performs this round. Once again, they can just do it if they have a skill that's high enough. Uh, here's a little strategy for Arkham Horror the Card Game. Drawing tokens, when you don't have to, just don't do it. If you don't have to do it, you'll succeed more. <laughs> and this is, it, that's how you lose when you draw the auto fail. This one, just don't do it. Just say, no, I'm just going to just pass this test. And it's pretty, pretty bonkers when you can get it going. More so when you can refill it once we get to the cards that uh, work with this archetype as well. Uh, Travis, I'll let you take segment of the Onyx and Pendant of the Queen. I'll, I'll throw these ones to you. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, so this is... Uh, it's technically all the same card, actually. But uh, Segment of Onyx costs one experience to put into your deck, and you get all three copies of it, because that's how Myriad works. Costs one to play, commits for a while, it's got fast, so it doesn't take any actions to play them. And as a lightning bolt, if you have three copies of Segment of Onyx in play, so all of them, you can set them aside and put the Pen of the Queen into play. Pen of the Queen comes to play with three uses. Um... And if it has no uses, you put it aside and shuffle the three segments back into your deck. And as a lightning bolt, you can exhaust the pen of the queen. Spend one of the charges to choose a reveal location and choose one. Either move to that location, discover a clue at that location, or automatically evade an enemy at that location. Um, this card takes up the necklace slot, which is uh, hotly contested in relic decks, but the effect is usually very worth it. Um, Finding all three copies of Segment of Onyx might seem a little bit daunting, but uh, especially with the allies available, Witten Green and Dr. Ellie, it's not too hard to put them together, especially when combined with some of Yellow's other card-drawn searching options. 
And uh, you can actually build an entire deck around just like playing this card, using it, and then putting it back, shuffling the segments back, and just putting them back together over and over again. It's a fun card, like I recommend you give it a shot, and don't be scared. Uh, don't be scared to. Uh, don't be scared about the having to put them together. Yeah, it's, it's in the right deck. It's the literally the easiest thing in the world. Okay, uh, I've not played with these cards. Uh, I can't tell you what they do, so I think Travis, you probably know the most about these. So I'm gonna throw these ones to you too. Yeah, I played with them a couple times. Yeah. So these all came in the Harvey Walters deck. Uh, they are technically relics, but they're more about the hand size archetype. But you know, they're relics, so they're here. Another untranslated card. Um, the level zero one comes into play with five secrets. It's an action you can exhaust and spend one of the secrets to draw a card. And if you have ten or more cards in your hand and there are no secrets in the Forbidden Tome, you can record you translate the tome. It's like a little difficult to find the actions for some investigators. Um, depending a little bit on who you're playing, but it's not too uncommon to just have kind of five actions laying around throughout an entire scenario. Mm -hmm. um, um, especially, you do get something out of it, so. Uh, also, correct me if I'm wrong, but does the Eldritch Sophist move secrets around? Or is yeah. he just charges? you can suck them off of that. Yeah. Uh, and your two upgrade options, both cost three experience, take up hand slots again, same traits. Um, much, much better symbols. Mm -hmm. But uh, And then, again, you can only include them if you've done the thing, the untranslated card required. They both cost four actions to use their abilities, which you'll notice is more actions than you typically get in a turn. I didn't know. you have to exhaust them. Um, but both of them, the ability costs one less action for every four cards in your hand. So if you have eight cards in your hand, it only costs you two actions. If you have 12 cards in your hand, it only costs you one action. Um, this is why I'm talking about what I mean, that they only, they're, they're more for the hand size archetype, but... Mm -hmm. So the yeah. first one, Dark Knowledge, allows you to move one damage from any player card at your location to any enemy at, an, at that location, your location. Uh, so you can move it from your teammates, you can move it from you, you can move it from your allies, your teammates' allies, uh, for free Tesla's damage. It's you can move sweet. it from your Biko to put it on an enemy and then use your Biko again. Wow. Mm-hmm. My name, we have to try hand size, uh, Joe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we should. <laughs> Just play, like, every insight that draws you cards. Mm-hmm. And then the other one allows you to, uh, for the actions, you just discover a clue at your location. It's, that's it. That's <laughs> that's good. Well, you get to you get to move to a connecting location and discover a clue at that location. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so even I'm, better. I'm, I'm really <laughs> lost over that. Yeah, you get to be Duke, but not do the test. Mm -hmm. Hand size Ursula? Question mark. Yeah, so I think that these cards are worth. If you can consistently have eight cards in your hand, these cards are okay. If you can consistently only spend one action on this, whether that's through like Daisy or something like that, mm -hmm. Daisy's ability or Abigail Foreman, I think her name is. I think mm -hmm. she works with these. Uh, basically, if you can spend one action on them, they're great. If by some miracle you can spend zero zero actions on them, they're actually insane. Yeah. Yeah, that would be... Oh, no, it's to a minimal of one action. But you I can think, still kind of yeah. spend zero actions with But, like, uh, Daisy. Daisy with 12 cards in hand would make it uh, free. Quote-unquote free. Yeah, quote-unquote yeah. free. A lot of work to go... That's, like, that's a lot of work, but... Yeah, but I, I think these effects are, like, worth it for two actions, um, but you want to be aiming to get them for one if you're going to play them. You yeah, want it to be possible to get them for one if you're going to play them. It's, uh, like, mean, like, two actions... Oh, sorry, you go, Travis, you finish your thought. Yeah, two actions to, like, heal one of the cards and deal damage to an enemy is, like, pretty... It's, like, fine. Same thing with two actions to move and discover a clue at that location. Um, or just at your location. Like, that's worth two actions. It's worth a little bit more than two actions because you don't have to make the test to succeed to get the clue. Yeah, I think, like, the um, secrets revealed, the move and discover a clue, getting that when you, like, when you, if you can do it for two actions is, like, pretty good. Um, because not doing a test is, like, worth quite a bit, especially if it's, like, a high, like, 
you know, high shroud location or like in order to investigate, you need to like do something. Um, but these get really juicy if you can get them, if you, cause you can get to 12 maximum hand size in Harvey Walters and even just in general, right? Like there's cards that increase your hand size by two. 12 is like pretty easy if you're trying. Yeah, so like I think getting these for one action is very doable, but it's less like part of like a relic package at that point, and it is just like a hand size matter package at that point, which we do have an archetype video coming out in the future. But because they are relics, they are relevant, especially with um, uh, some other synergies that come with that. Yeah, like this one is great if you want to just uh, draw a card after playing it with Unearth the Ancients. <laughs> it would probably be very easy mm -hmm. to put into play. <laughs> with only one cost. Sick. What are some other synergies uh, for relics? Well, let me tell you, everybody watching at home, off-class relics. There are many strong relics in other classes, so being able to splash into those is super sweet. Um, of course, with this archetype guide, we like to keep it just to monocolor when it comes to talking about the notable cards. Ignore that we didn't do that last week. Uh, but going forward, we generally like to only focus on one uh, color, one class for these uh, videos uh, and we're going to see in the deck coming up some examples of some stronger uh, off-class relics. Uh, the, Seeker, the Seeker Secrets archetype oh, uh, is also uh, <laughs> some great synergy there. Being able to refill secrets on relics that use them is very strong. Uh, for example, the Narcotic Manuscripts, it only has three secrets, but if you can keep refilling those secrets, suddenly you just can take so many um, so many uh act so many tests without having to draw a token and that's like really really nice uh one thing you can ask yourself is uh whenever you play like a card like necotic manuscripts it's like okay so this card was balanced for me to pay five experience and then it's cost to play it for three secrets anytime you get more secrets on it you're essentially getting more value and getting ahead of the cost that you that the game designed for that card. Of course, cards that put secrets on things also have a cost on their own, but generally being able to use your really strong relics more than they were originally intended to be used for is just juicy goodness. Sick. Uh, Travis, I'll throw this deck to you. Yeah, so um, actually, Bryn, I know you've never seen this deck before, but I'm sure you could tell me all about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's full of cards that you like to play. <laughs> it's full of cards I like. Yeah, so this is just like a... It's pretty basic Seeker one. Um, we got Urslik. She can play the Seeker Relics. Um, of course, we're playing our Dr. Ellie's, our Wit and Greens, um, to find our Relics, as well as a Charisma, because most of the Relics we have, we want to sit and play once we've played them. Um, those relics being a Tooth of Edsley, just to bump up those defensive stats a little bit. The Crystallizer of Dreams, which we will get to in a minute here. Um, <laughs> uh, a Skeleton Key to make investigating even easier. And some Noctic Manuscripts is the big payoff, because they're just, they're like really good cards. <laughs> uh, two Field Works, because um, Ursula's in the art, and it's like very good with her, and you should play it with her. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we got some deductions, because yellow deck, we got some guts, because, like, <laughs> guts is good. You should play it. Yeah, guts is good. Uh, <laughs> we got some perceptions, because Ursula has, Ursula's four book is, like, fine, but it is a little bit subpar in a lot of cases, and the perception just helps kind of um, smooth that out until you can get the crystallizer of dreams. Mm -hmm. Um, engine going here. Before we move on So for those of you who don't know, Crystallizer... Oh, sorry, sorry Travis. Before we go on to Crystallizer, I'm just gonna... I had to just make a small point. Uh, someone recently commented uh, why uh, why Guts was in one of the deck lists that we had previously in a series um, because there were no cards in our deck that took advantage of Brain, so why would we put Guts in? Uh, guts is good because uh, your brain is your defensive stat. It is how the Mythos deck hurts you uh, by making you test your brain. Like for example, Rotting Remains, test brain three for each point you fail by take one horror. Um, that sucks, taking horror. Like you could take three horror from that. That is really chunky. So with Ursula Downs right now, you're taking three horror if you draw a minus three, that really sucks. Uh, you get your guts going, now you're at testing five to three. It's like, it's like the juicy defensive card 
And then not only when you not take damage from it, you get a draw card, it replaces itself afterwards. So Guts is good because it's a defensive card and it fits in pretty much every deck. The only decks that I say you don't put it in are cards where you can have skills that help your brain in other ways that like your uh, investigator benefits from better or in someone like Finn Edwards or other green characters that have one yeah. brain. And in that case, you just accept it. Uh, I mean, you still could, like still testing three to three is better than one to three, but also that's fine where like, you can make the case there that it's okay to just be like, I'm not gonna include Guts. And when you're just starting out, understanding why Guts is good, the best way to do that is by putting it in your deck and seeing the value it gives you. Travis, we haven't done that speech in a while, so I just thought I would do it again. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty fair. Yeah, uh, passing yeah. back to you, Travis, for the Crystallizer. Yeah, Crystallizer. After you play an event, you attach it face down to the Crystallizer of Dreams, which is a weird thing to do. Why isn't it face up? But whatever. Instead of discarding it to a maximum of five things under the Crystallizer. And then the events that are attached to Crystallizer may be committed to skill tests as though they were in your hand. So if you check out our event suite here, we have a big pile of book and foot icons to make use of. Um, starting from the top of the Arkham DB list. We have Cryptic Writings. This is a nice resource engine uh, that it just it only gives you two resources, which is technically less than um, the than emergency cash. And you're not going to be drawing it too often during your turn to get the free play. But it does commit for two books, which is like good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's an emergency sketches. cash and a perception. Yeah. Yeah. Almost. <laughs> Uh, we got Preposterous Sketches. This one only commits for a brain or a book, but it allows you to draw three cards, which is going to be essential to churn through, to keep the skill icons coming to supplement that four book. Mm -hmm. uh, we got two copies of Level 2 Seeking Answers, which is good to, with the Call of the Unknown, because, so you can, like, pick and eat, it's good in general, but especially with the Colony Unknown, where you can pick an easy location to be the one that you're going to investigate, go there, play Seeking Answers, investigate, and then take, like, two clues from a different location that actually has clues on it. Um, on top of that, it also commits for a book and two feet, which is weird for a yellow card, but very nice for Ursula. Yeah. You've got two copies of Shortcut, because free moves are good, and also Brain and Foot, both very relevant stats. Two copies of Truth from Fiction, level two, which gives us a whopping three book in the Crystallizer, but also allows you to put more secrets on your Noptic manuscripts, because once you paid five for one of those, realistically, you're probably not going to be able to do it again, mm -hmm. especially if you've played some of your allies. And then our last event is the Unearth the Ancients, which... Um, commits for two book after you use it yeah and also like sometimes you gotta play a relic and your economy is a little bit uh hurt because you've played your your manuscripts and your ellie and and your allies and you just got to get something out and then it turns into two books uh two books for a skill test later it's pretty sweet there yeah yeah, yeah. plus with the crystallizer of dreams you can probably test your book at like yeah you know, seven or eight if you need to yeah 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 sick I think it's cool. One mm -hmm. cool thing you can do with this is uh, it's not listed here, but the Guardian of the Crystallizer who gets shuffled into your deck after you play the you put the Crystallizer into play. If Doctor Ellie Horowitz is holding the Crystallizer of Dreams, you can feed her to the Guardian <laughs> and just make him go away. <laughs> like, no, she took it. Oh, this is pretty sick. <laughs> She's the one you want. Dr. Ellie's like, do I really have to hold the jellyfish egg? And you're like, yes. Like, yes, Ellie. I promise it's important. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I'm I'm kind of like I'm, I'm into. I want to try a crystallizer deck. I think I think this deck would be pretty a pretty good way to work into it. Uh, if you haven't tried that out, uh, if, if you're looking at what you should play next, I think this is a pretty sweet deck to try it out with. Heck yeah. Yeah, but you like that unearth the ancients being like useful. I disagree. Yeah, Brent's but, like, uh, I, I reject your continue. reality and substitute it with my <laughs> yeah. own. Yeah. yeah. I think it's good. Yeah, well, there's only one way to find out. I don't know mm -hmm. what it is, but it'll be a series we'll eventually do where we have to play with the cards we hate. And we're going to hate that series, episode one. 
I don't want to play with Relentless, man. Travis, you're going to play Grimm's Fairy Tales, God damn it, in a green no. character. That's what's going to happen. No. All right. If you play if you play it with Preston, you could trigger it for free. If you guys do that, I'm going to play an Agnes deck, and it's going to be good. Mm. <laughs> uh, all Maybe. right. All right. That is this week's Archetype Guide. Next week, we have a Mystic one coming up. I believe it's going to be Token Manipulation or something similar to that. I saw a request for that in the comments. Uh, but keep the comments coming for future archetype guides you want to see. This is a fun series I really enjoy doing, also because it's really easy to make the slides for it. It only takes me like 10 minutes. It's a good time. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, we'll see you guys uh, next Saturday for another one, or uh, tomorrow for another exciting... Uh, I think tomorrow we have a video, five cool cards for Skids O'Toole, so get ready for that. Thanks for watching, have a good one, and as always, GG's.